Today we'll show how to compute the net electric field for charges spread out on a rod. Let's recall earlier we discussed the key steps for carrying out this kind of calculation for a charged object. First, we divide the charged object into pieces. Next, we have to find a math expression for the electric field due to one typical piece. Then finally, we use that expression to sum up all the electric field contributions from all the pieces to get the net electric field due to charge spread out over some object. So we're going to apply this to the case of a charged rod. And let's remember that the summing process that we do at the end can be done either analytically or numerically using a computer. And we're going to do both here in this lecture. First, let's do a demonstration of the numerical calculation, which will allow us to visualize the calculation process. We start with a rod of some finite length, shown here in red, with charge spread uniformly over the rod. Here we'll assume the charge is positive. Step one is to divide the rod into pieces, where here we'll visualize each piece as a red sphere. Here, the location of the sphere's center will be taken as the location of all the charge on a given piece. The size of the sphere is chosen only to allow us to visualize each piece easily. In the numerical calculation, we decide how many pieces we want to work with. In general, the more pieces we choose, the more precisely we'll be able to locate the position of the charge on each piece. Now step two is to write down the expression for the electric field for a given piece. Here we'll treat each piece as a point charge, which we'll co then code up in the program. Finally, we compute the E field for each piece and add up all the contributions. In the computer program, we'll do that one piece at a time. We'll start with the piece at the bottom, where the black arrow locates the observation location with respect to the bottom piece. The red arrow shows the total electric field so far, which at this point is just due to the bottom piece. Now, as we visit each piece in turn, we find additional contributions of each piece. The E field contribution of the piece we're focused on at the moment is shown by the blue arrow. The red arrow gives the sum of all the E field contributions we've calculated so far. As we progress through all the pieces, we get the final result. The red arrow represents the net electric field due to the rod at the observation location. In our second lab, you will have a chance to write your own program to add up the electric field due to a charged rod. But for now, let's notice that the observation location that we've chosen here is rather special. It lies on a symmetry axis. Call it the x-axis. That perpendicularly bisects the rod. This has the effect that the net E field of the rod is non-zero only along this symmetry axis, here the x-axis, even though the field due to each piece of the rod has both x and y components. We can see why this is so in this figure. For each piece of the rod above the symmetry axis, there's a corresponding piece located symmetrically below the symmetry axis. The blue arrows illustrate the E fields due to these two pieces. We can see the Y components of the blue arrows will cancel each other, that is add to zero, while the X components will add to something non-zero, illustrated by the red arrow. Let's use this insight to guide an analytic calculation of a charged rod's E field on the symmetry axis. Consider a rod of length L with its center at the origin and oriented parallel to the y-axis. Let's assume a total positive charge, capital Q, is spread uniformly on the rod. Let's calculate the net electric field due to the rod at a location on the symmetry axis, which we'll take here to be the x-axis. 
Step 1. Let's break up the rod into pieces. Let's consider a typical piece of length delta y located at position y. Now for this typical piece, let's do step 2. Come up with a math expression that describes the electric field of this piece at the observation location on the x-axis. We're going to treat this piece and all other pieces like point charges. So let's write down the point charge formula for this piece's electric field contribution. Call it vector delta E. Now this E field depends on the amount of charge delta Q on the piece of rod and on the vector R that locates the observation location with respect to the piece of rod. We're going to need to figure out these quantities, so let's do that now. First, we see from our sketch that we can use a little trig to figure out the magnitude of vector R. That magnitude is the hypotenuse of a right triangle whose legs are length x and y. So using the Pythagorean theorem, we can find the magnitude of vector R. Next, let's notice that uniform charge on the rod means the amount of charge on a given piece of rod is proportional to the length. Proportional here means that if we take the ratio of the charge on any piece of rod divided by the length of that piece, that's a constant. And in particular, that constant is equal to the total charge Q divided by the total length of the rod L. So the ratio of delta Q divided by delta Y is equal to this same constant. We can use this expression to solve for delta Q in terms of the length of the small piece of rod delta Y like this. So let's insert this into the expression for the magnitude of delta E. Now let's recall that for this observation location on the symmetry axis, we only need the components of delta E parallel to this axis. Here, that's the x component of delta E. Here's how we can find the x component. Notice that the vector delta E makes an angle of phi with respect to the x-axis. Phi is also an angle in the right triangle we looked at earlier. Moreover, the cosine of this angle is just the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, or x over the magnitude of vector r. This is exactly the trig function we need because for this problem, the magnitude of vector delta E times the cosine of phi is the x component of delta E. So here's the expression for that. We're now in a position to do the final setup. Sum up all the E field contributions of all the pieces that make up the rod. We're going to pass over to the limit of very small pieces. So delta y goes over to dy, and delta e sub x goes over to dex, the x component of an infinitesimally small piece of charged rod of length dy. We're also going to now insert explicitly the expression for the magnitude of the vector r. We now will integrate over y to sum up all the contributions. We integrate from the bottom end of the rod at y equals minus l over 2 to the top end of the rod at y equals l over 2. To do this integral, we need to look up the indefinite integral of this form, which ends up being this. We then evaluate over the limits and simplify to obtain this result.
the net electric field of the rod for observation locations a distance x from the rod along the symmetry axis. Recall again that all other components of the net electric field of the rod are zero for observation locations on this axis. Now having said that, let's note that while we did this calculation for the x-axis as the symmetry axis, this result holds for any point on the plane that perpendicularly bisects the rod. So we're going to write our final result in a little more general form where we replace the variable x with r where r represents the distance from the rod to any point on the symmetry plane. Let's also note that if the rod is positively charged, the direction of the field is radially outward from the rod, while if the rod is negatively charged, the direction of the field is radially inward. As a final note, let's look at some limiting cases for the E-field due to the uniformly charged rod. In the limit that r is very large compared to the length of the rod, we see we can neglect the expression containing l in the denominator. And this makes sense because if we're far enough away from the rod, it will, to a large degree, just look like all the charge is at the same spatial location, like a point charge. If we look at another case where, in fact, we're very close to the rod, that is, r is much smaller than the length of the rod, then we can neglect the term containing r under the radical sign and with a little simplification obtain this expression which tells us that the electric field falls off like 1 over r. As a side note, when we're really close to the rod, this result will still be quite good even if we're not exactly on the symmetry plane. That's it for this lecture. We'll pick up with a new topic, the electric field of a charged ring, in our next lecture.